Alhamdulillah, peace be with you. Greetings, the best of greetings, the same greeting that Jesus, Moses, and the last and final messenger sent to mankind upon Muhammad. They greeted their followers with this greeting of peace, and we're greeting you with that greeting here today. And Muslims are from all around the world. That's right, we got a Greek Muslim, Hamza Dorsis, here on the D Show to tell us his story on how he came to this beautiful way of life. Islam, submission to the one God. We'll be right back with his story here on the D Show. This is the D, the D. This is the Peace be with you. rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you and you, brother. Yeah, how is the boy? What's going on? How the people in Greece? They're okay, I guess. You like the Greek food? No, really. So now what? Did you become an Arab? You were Greek. Now did you becoming a Muslim? You think I have the ability to change my DNA? I mean, what do you think this is? So you're a Greek. Muslim. Yes. Is that that's like you know? Hey, amazing. There's a there's a, are there a lot of Greek Muslims in uh, there I mean, are, are not people who've descended from other places, but people from Greece accepting this way of life. Yeah, uh -huh. and it's growing. There's Greek organizations that are Islamic and uh, calling people. Stroke, secular. So you were just in a, it was a big a buffet. Cocktail. It was a buffet. Man. It was a buffet. Okay. It was a buffet. And so tell us a little about yourself before Islam. Okay. Well, my name is Andreas. <laughs> that was my name, Andreas Dordis. And I came. I was born in London, in England. My dad is from Athens, but originally from Northwest Greece. My mom is from the Greek part of Cyprus. She came to England because of the 1974 invasion, the Turkish invasion of one third of the island. So my parents met and. I came about and I was brought up in an area called Hackney. It's equivalent to the Bronx at that time. Hackney was a bit of a ghetto, rough area. We used to live in these block of flats based in a ditch. Like for example, we were on the second floor and the second floor was in line with the ground. So this is the kind of environment I was, I was brought up in. And it wasn't easy. There was some drugs in the environment, gangs, Chinese gangs, especially the triads. You were in a Chinese gang? I was, yeah. yeah. I was in 14K. For, okay. 14k. There was like Wolfsing War yeah. and 14k. I was in 14k. This way, these trousers with these stars on them and all these symbols. Mm -hmm. We used to carry like choppers in our bags. Yeah. bringing in kind of environment although I was quite an intelligent kid as well at the same time so I was in two worlds I think many kids have that issue as well they got good family background compassion love they're intelligent but they want to conform to society and all children want to do this they want to conform and this is how social norms are developed in society by human beings wanting to conform we want to be certain we don't want to be alienated that's why Islam teaches you to be a leader to be a shepherd not the sheep so you bring your flock, and this is even in our community in Chicago, wherever we are, that we have a distinct character because we worship the Creator, not the creation. If that's the case, you'd be distinct and everyone wants to follow you, you know, you follow them. But unfortunately, I didn't have that Islamic background because I wasn't brought up as a Muslim. And so that was my kind of environment. How old were you around that time? Well, it was from the age of 14 to 19. 14. So what happened at that age of 14, 15? You're going along life, you know, you're just doing what normal kids are doing, music, you know, um, movies, yeah, I mean, just, uh, gangs. Like I was a bit unique though as well because my dad would take me to like the Royal School of Music and then classical guitar. I used to know how to read and write music as well. Mm -hmm. I used to learn Chinese, Mandarin. Ni hen piao liang. I said, you're very pretty. So you, Mashallah, Mashallah, Allah. Allah. you speak Chinese? No, no, no I, I used to learn okay, it for okay. a year, and then after when I became Muslim, I stopped and I went to go into other studies. But I was dabbling into Chinese, uh -huh. different cultures, I was into Kung Fu, 
Wing Chun Kung Fu, Shaolin, still Y M Mantis, yeah? So these, I was very cultural at the same time. So it was like almost a, a double life or a triple life I was leading. And, you know, women and stuff like that. So I was a confused kid. I didn't know who I was from that perspective. But I always had a good respect for traditions like Buddhism and Islam. And I used to read around these things quite a lot, even at, at a young age. So how does Islam fit in? Did you meet a Muslim? Did you read something on the internet? How, were, you at a, were you seeking guidance? Because a lot of the people we talk to will ask them, have you ever asked God for guidance? Because we believe if you ask the Creator for guidance, He'll facilitate yeah, the way. I, I, I'll get so, to so that. What, were, were, were you like, okay, did she break your heart? <laughs> uh, did, were you just, was the nightclubs getting played out? Did the other gang kid beating up on you? Or did you, did you like get to a point where you're like, I'm just sick of everything. What was it? Well, I tell you what it is. I always wanted to know truth. My dad said to me, always have an open mind, read every tradition. So when I was at high school, I used to have a Muslim friend. He came from Bangladesh and he was such a nice guy. He was very distinct. He was a cool guy, but he wouldn't muck about with women. He would honor women. He would honor human beings. He would be very distinct. Very, his principles won't change. They won't waver just to look good. And for me, that, I found that so attractive. And I wanted to be like him, so he was introducing me to Islam very slowly. He gave me this booklet called Faith and Progress by this brother called Jamal Howard, right? And it was about that God exists, that you got to think, reflect, because the Quran teaches you to think and reflect. It doesn't just have blind faith. Think, afala taqilun. Do you not use your intellect, your mind? This is the verbatim word of God, the Quran. Now. Yes, it's the verbatim word of God. And you're not quoting it in Arabic. It is Arabic. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're, you're, you're Greek, yes. and you've learned Arabic also. Well, you're quoting the Arabic. original. Like, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, if you wanted to follow, let's say, you're a Christian wanting to follow, let's say, the original teaching of Jesus, you can't. Uh, you don't have the original. You don't, so, no, you you don't, don't. see someone quoting Aramaic. Yes, you or don't. Latin. You don't see that. Of course not. But you're, you're quoting the original verbatim well, yes, word of God. Yes. It's the original text, right? Yes. This is why uh, Professor Angelica Neurath, in the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, she says the Quran we have today in Arabic is the same as we had 1400 years ago. So continue, I'm sorry for cutting you it's off. It's right. so, well, amazing. God says in the Quran, which means, and in themselves do they not see. The Quran uses the word, which means for those who reflect. Now this doesn't mean any type of reflecting, like, oh, you have a nice beard, Eddie. I like your gel, the way your hair moves. <laughs> you're a handsome guy, man. Not that kind of reflecting. This reflection is, the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must think about its implications. What does it mean? What does it mean? Quran wants you to think. It doesn't mean to be blind. That's why it says that you're going to follow your forefathers, even if they were based on falsehood. So this small booklet was a fascinating booklet. It opened my mind to something. I, thought, I was like, wow, I thought religions were all about blind faith. I thought religions were about not searching the truth and just... Just, just believing in your heart, but Islam is so unique, it's believing in your heart, understanding is part of your nature, but also it agrees with the mind. And that's the beautiful thing about Islam. So that started me off, although I didn't become a Muslim. I didn't become a Muslim. So what happened was, what happened was I went to university to study psychology. So I was studying psychology, and I was the kind of guy, but I was, I was a bit rough on the edges, I was just... Every, I was a nice guy, like my dad, you know, I wanted to copy my dad, my dad would help everybody. So my friends would say to me, we have a dissertation to do, we have to give it in, it's the last day, a few more hours left, a few more minutes left, can I copy your conclusion? And I was like, I was a nice guy, I said, take it, copy it. What happens, university finds out, I get in trouble, they get in trouble, I have to start the year again. Mm. This was the second year. I was upset, I had to take one module again. I sat in the tribunal, if you like, I said, it really, I didn't copy anybody, they copied me, I'm telling you, I, this is my spelling mistake, this is the way I write, and they knew that, but they had to be fair and said, look, everyone goes, because you gave them your work. So, what happened was, I took a year and I started working as a project officer to become a project manager. So I was working in, in the British government, I was working for the police IT organization at the time, I was learning more about project management, I was given a lot of money to do a lot of project management training, so I entered in that kind of office environment. And then, I was still reading more about Islam, but Christmas came, and we went to a boat party. Mm. And what happened at that boat party was basically a small milestone to change the rest of my life. From a boat party? From a boat party. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll tell you about the boat party maybe after the break. After the break, okay. So don't go nowhere. We, we want to know about this boat party here with Hamza Tarsis on the Dean Show.
Is your boss driving you crazy? Are you just living from paycheck to paycheck? Party to party? And everything is just getting tiring? It's getting played out and you're asking yourself, what's this all about? What's the purpose? Many people don't reflect on why am I here? You're born to die. And then what do you got in between? It's a big drama. Some days are good, some days are bad. Some days you're sick, some days you're sad. We, not, we might not make it to 85 years old. We might not make it till tomorrow. And this is something that we need to think about. The lights will go on after the party, and the party will end. And you will be alone, and you will have to be accountable for everything you've done. Life is not all about just chasing that man or woman or that good time. It's not all about the baseball game and the basketball game and chasing a position and getting a lot of wealth and money. There's more to this life. And it's up to you to be sincere enough within yourself and to want to know more. What's the purpose? What's it all about? Life. Back here on the Dean Show, and we're getting our brother Hamza Torses, Greek Muslim, didn't become an Arab. You don't obviously have to become an Arab in India or anything. If you're an American, you're an American Muslim. Muslim is simply one who submits, not to the creation, but to the creator. And you're following the best of mankind. Muhammad, peace be upon him, who's the last and final messenger sent to mankind. Is it true, this is the same way that if you're living during the time of Jesus, you would have to follow his teachings, not worship him. Yes. Is that true? Yes. So before we go to the boat party, now, were you, because your family was Christian? So did you follow the teachings at all? Did, you, did they believe that he was God, he died for the sins of the world? Did you believe that? Well, the thing with the Trinity and the Incarnation is that it confuses all the Greeks anyway. So that's they, they just believe in this man called Jesus, he was a really nice man, and we just have to be really nice to people. That's, the, that's Christianity in Greece now. Because, I mean... The being had three persons and one consciousness, one essence, bit of confusion. So is it kind of just embedded into the, the race now? Okay, they feel like, okay, this is a part of us. Okay, we're Greek. Yes. You live Greek, die Greek. You can't, exactly. if you, you become all, another religion, you've left Greek. Well, this you've is the point. Greek. I've been called a traitor because uh, I've become a Muslim. But yeah. I try to explain to people that's not true. And you're still Greek. I'm still Greek, of course. I like Greek food. I love my parents. The parents love me. I still speak Greek, I love Greek poetry, I like Greek literature. Antonis Samaragis, he wrote an amazing book called Zedita El Bis, Hope Wanted. It's a very kind of psychological, social book, short stories. It's fascinating. I'm still Greek from that perspective, okay? Mm -hmm. I still know how to Greek dance as well. <laughs> I might show you later, Eddie. Yeah? <laughs> so the boat party now, we're at the boat party. So we're at the boat party and basically I wasn't the kind of guy that liked parties anyway. Mm -hmm. I was more of like, I want to have a conversation, a bit of dinner, maybe do a workout, go to do some Kung Fu. You know, mm -hmm. we'll have some friends. But what happened was, is you know, an interesting uh, human being came up to me, female, and you know, all of creation is beautiful. Allah creates everything that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So uh, I realized she was a Muslim, mm. Mm. and I knew a lot about Islam, and I was really shocked. So I said, "Look, woman, sit down, man. No dancing. Sit down." And she's shocked, right? She's like, what's going on? Well, said, you told her that. I was telling her that. She was like, what's wrong with you? I said, listen, what's your name? You're a Muslim. <laughs> See, you shouldn't be doing this. I took the drink out of her hand. I gave her an orange juice. And we started talking about Islam. And I started saying to her, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. These guys. This you're not even Muslim at the time. I am not Muslim at the time. And her And she's like, who are you? Some kind of mufti? Some kind <laughs> of scholar? Some kind of mullah? I said, no, but you know, I know this reality. They don't really love you. They don't. They, they just see you as a piece of flesh. They objectify women in this society. But in Islam, we see women as a holistic human being. She's not just a piece of arm and a piece of knee and a piece of leg. And just some nice eyes. No, we see everything in its oneness. Hol holistic. So we see that she's a character, she's a spiritual, she's an intellectual, she's got a heart, she's a future mother. All of these beautiful things that we want to connect with. These guys don't want that. What are you doing here? She was shocked. 
You could imagine, right? So we exchange numbers, I go back to the office, I lost her number, nothing happens. After three months I get a call from the HR department, Human Resources. Bring, bring, Mr. Zodis, it's so and so on the line. And it was the lady. She somehow found out where I worked. She found, traced me down. She tracked me down, boy. So <laughs> <laughs> I pick up the phone. I'm discussing with her. So we, we have some kind, some kind of a friendship or relationship, if you want to call it that. But even then, it was emotionally allowing me to learn more about Islam in a way. Because even though she wasn't practicing, there is something about a Muslim woman. That when she was brought up in a Muslim family, it's like... <sighs> It's, it's like a purifier. You can have, you can have a, a bottle of water that's really muddy. You know the really small tablets you put in there and it cleans it up? Mm -hmm. That's what happens even if you know just the Iman, just the faith in God and knowing that you don't worship creation, you worship the Creator. That itself gives you a different kind of... Is like that, right? So that attracted me to read further. So I was reading about Islam as well. Then I was trying to teach her as well at the same time. To cut a long story short, she had to move back home. She was teaching. She had to move back home. She was studying and she had to move back home, get married, you know, what happens. And uh, she calls me after like a year or something. And I'm like, well, what's going on? You know, my dad picks up the phone, gives me the phone. And what does she say? She says, Andres. I want to say something to you, don't want to really want to speak to you. I was like, wow, what's going on here? I want to let you know that I'm wearing the hijab and I'm praying five times a day. <laughs> amazing, huh? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it moves me too, bro. It moves me too. It was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Like, like a non-Muslim, a disbeliever, could facilitate someone's guidance. And then she put the phone down. And then that shook to me, took me way back. Boom. It's like a big right hand. <laughs> like the one you gave me earlier, yeah? It's like a big right hand. And I'm like, wow, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do with my life? Because it made it real. It wasn't just abstract ideas. It was like it affected a human being in a profound way. So I started to pray. And I remember praying. And you, I, you hadn't taken the shahada? No, yet. I'm not a Muslim. Okay. <laughs> but I'm praying, bro. And I'm doing sajda. I remember a college kid. Uh -huh. And now he's a doctor. He's one of the best doctors. And he's a wrestler as well in England. He used to train the English team. Mm -hmm. His name is Dr. Amir. One of the beautiful brothers I met in my life. And Dr. Amir would come to college. And he'd be one of those distinct Muslims that would worship the creator, not the creation. and be very unique. Mm -hmm. And I looked up to him. And he said, you know when we're in sajda, prostration... Just like Jesus in the Bible when he says he put his face on the floor. That's how he prayed to God. Yeah, absolutely. That's how yeah. we pray. That's how we pray. And he said, when you're like this, you're closer to your Lord. And that's what I can remember from him. And that's why when Muslims, when they're listening to this, don't build it to the one word that you say to people. It could affect someone for the rest of their life. So I'm in sajda and I'm screaming. I'm screaming to God and they help me. So what's this? I was like, literally uh, treating God like he's just like, you know, I'm talking to someone in front of me. What's up, man? Help me. I don't know what's going on. Help me. And then I keep on praying. I keep on praying. I go to Greece. I go to Holland to see my granddad. And I have a Quran with me. And I learn Fatah in Arabic. Now, when you were screaming, you, were you, were, was it a screaming of guidance? You were like... Oh, like, of course. What, what were of you? course. I just wanted to know the way. You wanted to know the I way. I wanted to know the way. I said, look, God, you've always been in my life. I've never really rejected you. I used to even use the word Allah when I was walking down the street and I needed help in my life. I said, Ya Allah, if you are Allah, whoever you are, just help me. So when I was in such a prostration, I was screaming out to him for guidance, for help. I want to know the way, okay? You, you see, now things are transpiring. The, you see the way it's, he's facilitating a way. You exactly. Can see it well, the this would happen. Well, now I see he was facilitating me, but at the time I still was like, oh, I'm really frustrated. I go to Greece, I don't dance this time. I don't drink the alcohol this time. I don't stay up late this time. I'm at home reading an English translation of the Quran. I'm learning how to recite Arabic. I learn the first chapter of the Quran. I learn the 112th chapter of the Quran. I'm learning chapters in Arabic. Qul hu wallahu ahad. And it continues. Real quick, real quick. Just the, the, you said the first chapter. Define it in English. The first chapter is sort of Fatah, which means the opening. And it's the chapter we use that is necessary for our prayers. And that's, and that's the chapter. So we say it starts off by saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All grateful thanks and praise due to the Lord of everything that exists. To the, the one creator. God. Not Jesus, not man, not creation, not a stone, not a book, not a wall, not a pope, but the creator. Okay? So I learned that in Arabic and I started to pray even more. 
I came back to England and I stopped praying then I gave up existential crisis which means what it, it means to exist I just had a crisis and I was just in my own depressed mode and remember that guy I was talking to you about that Bengali kid the, the bar? yeah you're the, he, the he one that you wanted to be he like? knocks on my door on a Friday October the 4th 2002 and he says to me sit in my car I know you know the truth I gave you the booklet remember that booklet faith and progress Islam's the truth proof of God proof of creator he said this is the truth and you know and I was like, yeah, I do know, but I can't be Muslim. It's not here yet. So what did he do? He gave me an amazing story on death I can't even describe. Kullu nafsin al mawt. Every soul is going to taste death, the Quran says. And it was such an amazing story, amazing narrative, imagery. I don't even remember it, but I remember the effect. It was two in the morning, I went back home, and all of a sudden, everything I knew abstractly, intellectually, came straight here. In October the 5th, 2002, I took a taxi to the central mosque, there was 50 brothers there, and I took my shahada, my first prayer was dhuhr. And I didn't need no one to teach me, because Allah already helped me. You Greece. already learned how to pray, yes, amazing, yeah. amazing. We'll be right back with more with the rest of the story here on The Dean Show. This is The Dean Show. We're back here on The Dean Show, and we're talking to our brother, our Greek brother, who didn't become an Arab. He is a Muslim, still Greek. And it's amazing you accepted Islam the same way that Jesus lived. Jesus lived Islam, didn't he? Yes, he did. Jesus submitted to the will of God. That's Islam. Now, the Shahada, what did that entail? Well, the Shahada is that you witness that there is no deity worthy of worship but God, Allah. And interestingly, linguistically, the, the word, the name Allah is genderless and cannot have a plural. And Allah, some linguists in the Islamic tradition say is Al-Ilah, which means the deity. So there's no deity worthy of worship apart from the deity, the true deity, the true God. And you witness, I bore witness that Muhammad, upon whom be peace, is his last and final messenger. That's the same testimony, the swearing to, if you were living during the time of Jesus, yes. you'd have to make that same de de uh, testimony, That's right? That's it. You'd have to declare that there's nothing worthy of worship except the Creator in Arabic, Allah, in uh, Aramaic, Allah. Yeah, exactly. A and then Jesus is the messenger of God, right? Yes. So you didn't do anything different. Oh, not just that, I accepted reality. Like, for example, I say, oh, this is a really nice jacket, Eddie. That's accepting reality, it's a nice jacket. Islam is accepting reality because some people think you know there's going to be fireworks and angels and the whole universe is going to crumble when you take the declaration of faith but when I speak to you I'm like look you already know it's in your nature you've been convinced in your mind just accept reality and that's what I did I accepted the reality that there is truly no deity worthy of worship but God and Muhammad upon your peace is his final messenger. There's no other explanation. Now if someone is just, okay, they turn in late at night and they see us and you know, they have that void and they're listening, but then they fall back into the many pitfalls. You know, again, I talk about, you know, the movies, the music, the things that just warps the mind. You get in the car, you go to bed, wake up to music, wake up to move, everything is just, you know, entertainment. But why is this so important to think about this reality? You know, because when we die, it's finished. You can't yes. come back. You no. can't, once the test is over, then it's hellfire. Is that right? Yep. That's the warning that all the messages that came is, with. Yeah. The warning, avoid the hellfire. And paradise. Paradise is for forever. Of Eternal course. happiness, bliss. I mean, why is it, I mean, why, you, you mentioned that your, the Muslim friend, he mentioned death. Yes. Did that snap you out of it? Of course it did. Because the way he mentioned it, and I don't even remember what he said, it was so poetic, the way he described. I remember him saying something like, imagine I just stabbed you right now. And then he described the whole process. Uh -huh. People that you love, your family, your friends, and everything just became so real. So what the Quran does, is it's a realistic book, it's a psychological book. He wants to make reality appear to you in front of your face. This is why, you know, Allah, God in the Quran, He tries to dismantle our own egos and arrogance, because our ego and arrogance is the barrier to God, isn't it? Yeah. And, like, and the way the Quran does this is by saying, you're going to be worm buffet. You're going to be in your graves. Wake up. You think you're going to last forever? You're going to take over the world? You think you're, you're the king of kings? And also the Quran says, remember where you came from. You were despised fluid. You were a baby. You couldn't even clean your own bottom. You couldn't even feed yourself. And now you're arrogant. You think you can match the mountains in height. You think you're self-sufficient. Exactly. Now, right? And that's, that's and self, the, the act of self-sufficiency, the state of self-sufficiency is a barrier to Islam. Now I want to tell people though, 
Say you're listening to this message and you listen to Brother Eddie or, or you've read something nice on the internet, you have Muslim friends and you, and you like this tradition of Islam, you accept it's the truth. But you think, I'm still going to the club, I'm still doing this, I'm still doing that, I'm not worthy. Never, never, ever despair of the mercy of Allah, of God. This is one of Shaitan's, Satan's tricks. He wants to make you think that you're not worthy to now accept this tradition. Or no, you're not worthy to pray. Or you're not worthy to repent to Allah. Allah says, Oh, ya ibadi. Oh, my believing servants. Do not despair of the mercy of God for He forgives all sins. And he even says, despairing is an act of the disbeliever. Only the disbelievers despair. So if you want to be that believer, you know you shouldn't be in a state of despair. That God always wants U-turns. He allows U-turns. He wants you back all the time. You know, and that's what happens sometimes. And it happened to me, you know, you be watching, reading something nice, then you go back into your old ways and you think, I'm not worthy to go back. No, God wants you back. Doors always open. Always open. Take advantage into of the now. time of death. T tell, tell us now, we're almost out of time, so I, want, I have a few more points that I want to cover. For the person that had a bad experience, you know, and they start to put all religions in the same boat. They say, look, I don't want to follow an organ organized religion organized by man or men. And, and then they go and take a psychological, what it was, a philosophy class in yeah. college. And then they just, you know, they just leave it all. They paint them all the same brush and they put Islam in this bucket saying it's all man-made. What do you have to say? Well, the first thing is that people have to read the Quran. That's the number one point. This is our basis. This is our premise. This is our assumption. This is our foundation. And it's justified because we know it's true. Because the Quran challenges the whole of mankind. You find me a book that intellectually challenges mankind. Very brave from that perspective. In chapter 2 verse 23 the Quran says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُّوا بِسُرَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Which means, and if you're in doubt, you took a philosophy 101 class, you're an atheist, agnostic, you don't believe in, in religion, it's all dogma, what does the Quran say? If you are in doubt about this book, which we have sent down to our servant referring to the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace bring one chapter like it one chapter, the shortest chapter Surah al kawthar chapter al kawthar three lines and no one has been able to challenge this book as Professor Arbuthnot says although several attempts have been made to challenge the Quran none have yet succeeded and even Western linguists and academics like Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book The Quran, a biography he says on page number 8 Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, layered within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Professor Dr. Martin Zamet from the Netherlands, he says, not We have Professor Neil Robinson who converted to Islam as a result of understanding the Quran, reading it and knowing it's a literary and linguistic miracle that cannot be challenged. In his book, the Discovering the Quran, a contemporary approach to a veiled text in the chapter called the dynamic style of the Quran. He says the Quran is amazing, it's a dynamic style that no one, no one can reproduce and no other classical Arabic text can achieve what the Quran achieves linguistically. Can we make it even more simple for the people now because they'll say that look all religions you know all people they claim you know if you don't believe in this you're going to hell but really when you investigate it there's only two it's Christianity and Islam yes. correct me if I'm wrong and when you inv in investigate the claim that let's say our brothers in humanity make the Christians they'll say if you don't believe in Jesus your Lord and Savior you're going to hell when you investigate it Jesus never said that yes he never said this and when you investigate it further you see that he never claimed he was God he never said he's come and died for the sins of the exactly. world so but when you look in the Quran doesn't the Creator say that look if anyone chooses other than submission to the will of God is a way of life will never be accepted and this is clear you can go verify yes it. you can is that true you can it's in the Quran and what's interesting about the Christian claim of our beloved human beings brothers in humanity is that they say the Bible is the Word of God as we know it today. And they say that Jesus made these claims. But both of these things you can't verify. We have 7,000 New Testaments in historical record and none of them agree with one another. And it's in Greek. I know Greek. I've, I've read some of them myself. They don't, none of them, not one of them agree. So we don't know what Bible we're talking about. We don't have no originals. No, true? we don't have no originals. We don't have a copy of a copy of a copy no, of anything of original. No, if you read Bible scholars tell us this, right? Dr. Brutz Metzger, for example, when he was talking about the textual integrity of the Bible, he says, we don't know what's going on here, dude. That's simple as that. <laughs> That's simple. That's simple that as that. But with the Quran, I remember I mentioned earlier Angelica Nevrith, a scholar 
she's from, she wrote the book or she edited the book, the Cambridge Companion to the Quran. She says, what we have today is what we have 1400 years ago from the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. We have all this scholarship agreeing on this issue. So one, we know it's preserved, it's a linguistic and literary miracle and Therefore we know it's from God, because it can't come from an Arab, they failed to challenge it. Can't come from a non-Arab, can't come from Muhammad upon whom he peace, because he didn't have any linguistic skills like the Arabs did at that time. Therefore it must be from God. So the point is, if God says, if you don't accept this way of life, you're going to hell, you should wake us up. Should we should at least look into it. Yeah, of course. Take up the challenge. Exactly. Take, because what do we got at the end? Death. And exactly. then it's too late. Exactly. But if we submit to what God wants us to do, we got paradise. And we avoid the hellfire. Amazing. Ira, Ira? Yes. Tell us real quick and brief how people can get a hold of you. The Islamic Education and Research Academy we've launched in England, in the Canada. We want to go global soon, inshallah. And basically, we want to call people to the way of Allah, azawajal, to the way of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. And we're dedicating giving non Muslims the call to Islam. And we train Muslims on how to give dawah. We've got literature and leaflets and products. Ira.org.uk. Check us out. Real quick, we got 30 seconds, and the person is doing like you. He agrees that none should be worshipped except the Creator and not His creation. And he agrees that Muhammad is the last and final messenger. He looked into the six articles of faith, the five pillars of Islam. Really clear cut, simple. And he's lost like that. Nobody's given him the invitation. Tell him right now. He wants to accept Islam. What do you got to do? Well, all you have to do is just say the following words and believe it in your heart with conviction and certainty. Ashhadu. And la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness there is there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah but God, and I bear witness that Muhammad upon whom be peace is his final messenger. This is Islam, pure, simple. You don't need to, he, to do a Muslim now. You're Muslim. Say it in Greek. He wants to know in Greek now. <laughs> for the Greek, how do you translate this in Greek? In Greek, go ahead. Bista that 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 Allah don Allah. Ke o prophetis Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ine o prophetis to Allah. So there is no God other than Allah God, and the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, is his prophet. That's it. Thank you very Salam much. Thank Allah. you very much. God Almighty, the Creator, reward you. Salam Good Salam. to see you, bro. Salam we'll hear you back again, inshallah soon. Inshallah. And it's that simple, it's that easy, it's not meant to be com complicated. Worship the Creator, not His creation, and God sent the last and final messenger. Muhammad, peace be upon him. The same way if you're living during the time of Jesus, we said you got to follow his teachings, but Muhammad is the last and final messenger as God to guide you. That's the first step. And he'll facilitate a way. He'll facilitate a way. Parting all day, chasing your lusts and desires is not going to bring you happiness. You'll have peace, contentment. You'll have the best in this life and the best in the hereafter. Yeah, life is a challenge, but when you got God on your side, you can overcome those challenges. And for every hardship, God will reward you. And you'll be doing something that's pleasing to God. And then you'll get the reward from God. And you'll avoid the hellfire. And you'll attain the paradise. Give us a call, 1-800-662-ISLAM, to learn more, to get the verbatim word of God for free. The Quran will see you next time. Until then, peace be with you.